Hi there. So I'm going to talk about sesalsaurated lesions. We used to call them sesalsaurated lesions slash polyp. The word is lesion, although I'd so much prefer the word adenoma. Again, this is for your first year trainee. When you look at sesalsaurated lesions under very low power, they look essentially like hyperplastic polyp. None of that blueness that you typically see with an adenoma. Remember, they are typically on the right side and they tend to be larger than one centimeter, but you can see them on the left side and they can be smaller. If you were to make a diagnosis of a sesalsaurated lesion based solely on size and location, you might as well drop pathology and become a gastroenterologist. That's my joke for the day. Right, so how do you make a diagnosis of a sesalsaurated lesion? The first thing I will tell you is forget the top. The top is uh, will get you only so far as a serrated lesion. What's going on on the top will not help you distinguish between a sesalsaurated lesion and a hyperplastic polyp. Both of those lesions will show serrations. Here's a beautiful example of serration. Notice these sawtooth-like profiles. And if you get a crypt cut in the appropriate plane, you'll see the star-shaped profile. So this is very typical. In both polyps, the lining epithelium is made up of this mucinous, almost foveolar-type epithelium, often with a microvesicular phenotype. They will be scattered goblet cells. But like I said, forget the top. Let's look at the base because to make a diagnosis of a sesalsaurated lesion, you require the base. As Megan Craner would say, it's all about the base. It's all about the base. All right, so three things you're looking for at the base. The first is dilated crypts. Here's a narrow crypt. This is what a narrow crypt should look like dilatation of the crypts, unequivocal dilatation of the crypts, criteria number one. Criteria number two, serrations. Here you see them, serrations going all the way to the base. So that's criteria number two. Criteria number three is crypts that instead of working, going straight down, instead start deviating and running parallel to the muscularis mucosa. And now this crypt is trying to do that. Now when it happens in the most overt form, what you will see is boot-shaped crypts. So here's a boot. It's a very tiny boot. It's a fetal boot, but it's a boot nevertheless. So that abnormal growth pattern running parallel to the muscularis mucosa is a feature of a sesalsaurated lesion. You often see branching like that of the crypts in a sesalsaurated lesion, but that is not a criterion that is often used. The fourth feature that often people talk about is an abnormal proliferative zone somewhere in the mid-crypt region. I personally don't find that particularly helpful. So the next question is, how many abnormal crypts do you have to see? If you look at the most recent version of the WHO criteria, all you need is one abnormal crypt but it's got to be obviously abnormal. Subtly abnormal crypts do not count. I invariably, I'm a lot more demanding. I require more than one. I'd like to see two or three crypts before I make a diagnosis of a sesalsaurated lesion. But you will find people making a diagnosis on a single abnormal crypt on a single abnormal feature. You need not see all three features. Just one of those features is sufficient. And again, you will not rely exclusively on location and size. You make the diagnosis under the microscope and location and size is icing on the cake that can help you and obviously tastes good. But there's one additional feature with regards to this polyp, and here it is. SSA, 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 and then all of a sudden the architecture seems to change. Now take a close look at this. What's changed? Perhaps these cells have got a little darker. They appear slightly more hypochromatic, but I think more importantly, and you'll have to forgive me for all of this cautery artifact, there is increased crowding of the glands. But 
those architectural changes i will confess are very subtle i think what is more relevant as far as i am concerned is what's going on with the cytology of these cells if you notice the cytology here and here the cells have gotten instead of being tall and columnar have gotten more cuboidalized and acquired this prominent nucleoli again i'm a great believer in comparing what you think is abnormal with what you think is less abnormal so to me this crypt looks serrated this is sessile serrated lesion this crypt looks different because the nuclei are enlarged they're hyperchromatic and they're big prominent nucleoli in fact there's a mitotic figure so that comparison to me is very helpful in deciding that this epithelium is pretty atypical does that atypical epithelium go to the surface it probably does i know it's rather hard to see but again this is a serrated crypt with significantly more cyto cytologic atypia cytologic atypia above and beyond what you would see with ssl serrated lesion you can use immunohistochemistry to support your diagnosis and what you're looking for is loss of mlh1 or pms2 and i apologize for this slide it's somewhat fuzzy but even on very low par, notice this is the fragment under consideration. You'll see the staining all the way here and that atypical area, there's complete loss of MLH1 and PMS2. But before I go there, and forgive me all for all this bub air, air bubbles, but before I go there, I think there are some subtleties with regards to interpreting MLH1 and PMS2 on a sessile lesion, and that is, and then sessile serrated lesion without dysplasia, the base tends to be very strong. And if you go to the top, the intensity of the staining decreases. So do not mistake this loss of reactivity on the surface as loss of MLH1 and PMS2. So there is this maturation-like phenomenon. And here's that area under consideration. This, these were the atypical glands. Notice how these glands have acquired these smaller profiles. That's another feature of dysplasia. They've also gotten crowded together. They've acquired these smaller profiles and they have significant atypia. That's another cluster of abnormal glands. And what you can clearly see is intact, intact, intact. And these atypical glands have lost MLH one and pms2 this specific stain is mlh1 so the mlh1 slash pms2 can be extremely helpful in confirming dysplasia but remember only about 50 percent of cases lose mlh1 or pms2 that is 50 percent of cases of sessile serrated lesions with dysplasia lose mlh1 or pms2 so the loss is helpful but if it's intact it does not help you one way or the other one final question, does one grade dysplasia in sessile serrated lesions? And the answer is no. I guess nothing, you know, there's nothing to stop you from grading dysplasia. The argument against dysplasia, grading dysplasia in a sessile serrated lesion is that there is so much inter-observer variability that it simply does not make clinical sense. And finally, there are actually two kinds of dysplasia. There's the adenomatous dysplasia and the serrated dysplasia. Does it matter clinically? No, it doesn't. So don't bother yourself. But if you must know, this is the serrated kind of dysplasia. The adenomatous type dysplasia looks like a tubular adenoma. So bottom line, this is a sessile serrated lesion with dysplasia with loss of MLH1.